All right, Alex, my um, I'm going to shut my if you just turn your webcam on when I shut mine off. Perfect. Okay. All right, well, we're just gonna wait a few seconds um, for people to uh, jump on to the webinar. Um, so far, we have 79 people um, online. And our registration was around um, 112. So we really appreciate um, the interest and uh, yeah, you signing up uh, to take part today. And we'll just give it a couple of more seconds here before we get going. All right, so I think we uh, we will we will get started. So um, thank you uh, again for uh, being a part of today. Um, we're just going to go through a few uh, housekeeping uh, rules to help uh, make everybody's experience um, as best as we can. Uh, my name is Marla Carlson. I'm the executive director of SASC Organic, so probably good to start there. Um, and welcome to the uh, webinar. So just a few housekeeping rules, um, just so that you have the best experience. If you could close down any unnecessary programs uh, that might be running in the background, sometimes, sometimes that can affect uh, the quality of the video and audio. Um, all attendees, just to remind you, are in listen only mode. So only moderators and panelists can speak. However, attendees can ask questions by using the control panel on the right hand side of your screen and you'll just see uh, the arrow pointing to a question mark. There's also um, a chat function um, that you can use um, just to, if you're having any technical dif difficulties or any issues, if you can just use that function and just notice that you can choose how many people or who you are sending that to. So if it's a technical issue, you can just send it to um, Deb or myself and we'll do our best to help you out. Um, if you're joining by phone, you will have been prompted to enter an audio pin after joining the webinar, and we'd ask you to keep your phone on mute um, at all times uh, during the webinar because uh, we actually can hear the background noise if you're on by phone. So um, after each of our speakers, we're going to allow uh, just or have a few minutes built in for questions. So again, we'd ask you to send those in uh, during uh, using the question function. You don't have to wait until the end um, to send us your questions. Um, and I will be reading them out to the presenter and they will respond to those questions. So if you have a question sometime during uh, during the presentation itself, please just send it to me because I'm going to do my best to get in as many questions like as I can and to group some together. Um, so I'm sure there might be some repeats. So just so that we get as many questions answered as possible. Um, also a reminder that the webinar is being recorded, so we will all receive a link um, within 24 hours of the end of this uh, webinar, um, and you can view or download the, uh, the webinar at any time. And one final note, bear with us. It's our first webinar, and uh, we're doing our best to make it run as smoothly um, as possible. And a big shout out to our sponsors. One of the reasons why we did this, uh, this webinar uh, quite quickly after Advancing Organics is that we were all disappointed um, that we couldn't go ahead, but uh, understand you know, the reasons why to keep us all healthy and safe. Um, but we wanted uh, to provide uh, the some of the information anyway that was going to be uh, presented there at Advancing Organics. And we thought uh, grain marketing was a, a good place to start given, given the time of year. 
Um, so here's just um, a bit of a, a thank you to those sponsors um, of, it, of Advancing Organics, uh, who are um, the, the grain buyer sponsors for that conference. So thank you. Um, without you and those folks on the call, we couldn't, um, we couldn't do things like we're doing today. And for those of you who aren't familiar with SASP Organics, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but we are uh, the Industry Association for Certified Organic Farmers and Processors in uh, Saskatchewan. We're a farmer-led nonprofit member organization, that's a mouthful, representing 964 organic crop producers and 150 certified organic entities in the province. And here in Saskatchewan, we have 1.155 million acres um, being managed organically. Some of what we do, pre professional and development, professional and technical uh, development for our members, like webinars today, uh, research, market development, and government relations. So without further ado, I am going to uh, introduce Alex Heilman. He's the Director of Sales from Mercaris and our first speaker up today. Um, Alex oversees new business channels and advises the food and ag industry on economic and mar market conditions contracting efficiencies and commodity risk management opportunities across the organic and non-GMO sector. So thank you so much, Alex, for being here with us today. And we're all looking forward to what you have to say. Over to you. Wonderful. Thanks so much uh, for, for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, so without further ado, I will uh, start my presentation. Um, but while I'm starting this, um, I do want to give a little bit of a background on you know, who and what Mercaris is, um, just so you understand where this data set comes from and who I am and why you know, we actually have this pricing information available. Um, so Mercaris, essentially, uh, we're a, a data service and trading platform exclusively for the organic and non-GMO space. Um, what we do is we host um, the largest organic and non-GMO market survey in North America, where we for, uh, survey first purchasers of grain. It's anyone from kind of reach small regional country elevators all the way up to some large multinationals participate in it. Um, with that information, we're able to essentially aggregate all trades across you know, a number of different consumers, essentially. Uh, and from there, publish price information um, in addition to acreage, uh, import analysis, um, and some free reports that we directly give to farmers. Um, Beyond that, we're also, um, you know, a small portion of our business, about 20%, is an active trading platform. Um, you know, we don't own any physical assets whatsoever. Um, so we're simply in the space to connect buyers and sellers. Um, it's pretty agnostic. Again, it's open to pretty much all crops across the organic and non gmo landscape. Um, but we do have trades, actually. Um, to speak a little bit more about our data sets as well then, um, our survey encompasses uh, organic and non-GMO corn, organic and non-GMO soybeans, and organic wheat. Um, all of that's for food and feed across both categories. Um, and we're starting to expand now. Um, so the expansion is gonna be kind of within the small grains markets. So we're starting to pull trades together for oats, barley, and rye. Uh, and we're also expanding into some pulses currently. Um, these are quite new we've really only been doing it for about four months um so we're continuing to build this app so bear with us as you know our, our small grains cereals and pulses information gets a little bit better um but as you can see from this map you know we are pretty widespread in where we're collecting information from we're in almost every prairie province uh, i'm sorry we are in all prairie province in almost all provinces in canada um, and pretty dispersed across the us um so now kind of jumping into some market overview. Um, so, you know, to talk about organic, you first kind of have to talk about what's different and difficult uh, with organic. Um, you know, without going into certification, um, I want to really just kind of address two big issues. And one is processing and one is risk exposure. Um, so on the processing side, I constantly see the hurdle of essential, uh, essentially available storage. Um, there's very limited capacity. It's not as widespread as, as conventional naturally. Um, and so that yields a lot of different issues, whether it be just the cost of, of storage and carrying, um, as well as transportation costs. Um, within that, um, within the processing, pricing is, is a major hurdle as well, if not one of the largest ones, um, in the sense that you know, it's a very opaque market. Like there's not a lot of uh, insights into what's actually happening with pricing. And thus, you know, consumers aren't really able to essentially fully see what's actually happening at farm level trades. 
Um, and then on the risk exposure side, you know, there is no underlying futures contract for organics. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, instability and in volatility that happens due to that, uh, as well as liquidity issues. Um, it leads to there being a bit of a supply and demand imbalance. Um, and that mainly comes uh, directly because the US and Canada as well, um, consumption, you know, hurdles essentially um, what's actually produced in both of those areas, um, depending on what crop you're looking at in particular. Um, soybeans, for example, um, you know, we rely on almost 70% imports in the US just to meet consumer demand alone. Um, a lot of those big drivers tend to be kind of in the food markets, um, but it, it, again, just kind of yields a really interesting result that we don't really see in a lot of other commodity classes. Um, and then, you know, looking at things such as like crop insurance um, and, you know, organic policy issues also yields a whole litany of additional issues that actually happen within the organic space. Um, so just kind of jump into start seeing what we're what we're currently seeing in the marketplace. Um, you know, right now is a really crazy time, specifically with the COVID-19 crisis. Um, I mean, we've seen everything from port closures to supply and price shocks um, to basically facilities just outright closing down. Um, so we're still very much so kind of in the beginning of this and have yet to see how it's going to completely play out on supply chains. Um, but it's very concerning and something that we're keeping a very close eye on, as well as, you know, a number of other agencies. Um, so with that caveat kind of said, um, part of what I'm going to talk about is just looking at kind of the standard factors that we've seen. But we will take a little bit of a deeper look as well as to what we've actually started to encounter with this COVID crisis. Um, you know, 2019 was a bit of a very difficult year for organic growers and conventional growers altogether. You know, we had a really wet, cold spring. It, uh, you know, resulted in essentially delayed planting. Um, and then in the fall, we basically had really ridiculous conditions all over again, which then essentially yielded you know, delayed harvest. Um, that delayed harvest, you know, cut a lot of the yield expectations we were seeing in some of the, the biggest growing regions in particular. Um, you know, an overall, um, you know, crop production essentially, while it maintained, we did see some some shrinkage in some areas and some growth across others. Um, but with that being said, the number of U.S. certified field crops did grow about 6% year over year. Um, you know, Canadian acreage maintains uh, pretty stably, specifically within the Prairie Provinces. There was about a 28% growth from 2015 to 2018. Um, and then on the demand side of things, um, you know, livestock demand has been essentially flat. Um, you know, we actually did see a bit of a shrink in the number of operations in Canada that were handling livestock. Um, and in the U.S., it's essentially maintained. Um, and then on the, the feed demand for that livestock, which is the biggest driver in the organic space, um, we essentially saw that maintain. So it just grew by about 1%, um, which is kind of devastating because in the last 10 years, we've essentially seen double digit growth year over year. Um, but we, we do start to now kind of enter an era where that is starting to rebound more and more kind of because of the crisis we're currently in. Um, one other thing that's very different about organic versus conventional is that it's very much so a consumer driven sector. Um, demand is driven directly from that, whereas within the conventional side of the space, it's not necessarily driven directly by the consumer, but kind of driven by the market. Um, so looking at organic premiums now, um, organic premiums, and we're, we're looking at two to, uh, to the largest uh, points here being corn and soybeans. But when we start talking about prices here in just a moment, we will open this up to some small grains as well. Um, but what I want to do here is take this opportunity to highlight organic premiums um, and specifically address that organic premiums um, have, you know, are over 100% above conventional. Um, but most importantly, um, that organic premiums have maintained um, over the course of the last few years and specifically even right now in the last few months. Um, there's major concern right now that the organic premium will essentially drop um, as we're entering this kind of crazy price shocking crisis. Um, however, we are still seeing it hold in place despite, you know, we're seeing more and more depressed prices in the conventional space, despite some small rallies here and there. Um, so jumping directly into livestock feed demand, since this is the, the biggest driver for the organic space, um, you know, looking at this directly, we're seeing that most of that demand essentially is driven directly by soybeans, 
there's a little bit of a difference that's been happening in this um, year over year in that we're starting to now see more and more organic soybean meal come into play versus just direct soybeans and crushing. Um, so a lot of that comes directly from overseas sources, Argentina and India being kind of the biggest two players. Um, right now, there's also kind of port closure issues that we're starting to address, which is leading to more price surges as well. Um, but very much so, the biggest demand driver for the organic grains industry in particular is livestock, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> oops, sorry, going to the next slide here. Um, so in the 2020-2019 marketing year, year to date, um, you know, despite it be kind of a pretty bad year for yields, um, we did see some fantastic growth. Um, so field crops increased in the U.S. by about 13%. Um, it was 13% more organic corn farms as well, all of that being attributed directly to the corn belt for the most part. Um, and soybeans are starting to increase as well. A lot of that is, again, driven kind of by that livestock sector. Um, and I imagine that we're going to see more and more organic soybean um, acres continue to grow across the U.S. and Canada. Um, beyond that as well, um, you know, with slow organic livestock demand growth and production in 2020, uh, falling pricing prospects appear bearish before COVID-19. However, that is flipping the scripts now. Um, more and more risk yields kind of more and more volatility, which kind of yields increased pricing surges, as you'll kind of see on this left graph here. Um, so jumping now just directly into what we're seeing currently for organic uh, wheat supply. Um, so this is directly addressing winter wheat. Um, we're looking at U.S. production here. Um, we will talk a little bit about Canadian in a moment. Um, but within U.S. production, um, we saw about 12.5 million bushels produced in 2019. Um, those did have some higher yields, absolutely, um, within wheat in particular. The, the decreases we saw in yield tend to be kind of impacting corn and soybeans. Um, acreage has been flat year over year, um, or from, from 2019 or 2018 rather to 2019. Decline was mostly in the Corn Belt, Southeast and Western regions, um, and the increase was likely, you know, not likely, but in the High Plains, um, Montana in particular, we saw a huge organic uh, wheat acreage growth. Um, looking at spring wheat supply now, um, production, you know, did actually kind of uh, bump up quite significantly from 2018 to 2019, as I addressed earlier. But we saw about a 13% growth in that. Um, again, we also saw kind of similar growth statistics out of the prairie provinces as well. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of the growth right now, though, on the U.S. side of the region has been reliant on the yield increase, um, as well as that acreage increase. Um, so looking at current prices now, um, so what I did here is I mapped out essentially what we're seeing across different regions in the U.S. and Canada as well um, to show you essentially what that price indicates. Um, on the left-hand side here is current feed grade wheat pricing. Um, you can see the difference between Eastern and Western Canada, you know, showing about an average when you average all of these out of a little over $10 a bushel. And then on the feed grade side, uh, I'm sorry, the food grade side rather, we're seeing about an average of about $12.50 a bushel for food grade organic wheat prices. Um, now to address some small grains, um, again, you know, this isn't as robust just yet as we're just kind of starting to build this. Um, but so far for oats, we're seeing, you know, a huge increase in both demand and supply. Um, it's still kind of a little early to see where this is really going to go. Um, but oat prices um, year to date thus far have been about $18 a bushel for food grade. Um, and then I do, I am starting to see a lot of forward contracts come through for oats into 2021, um, with that average price being about $22.40 a bushel. Um, barley and rye, which have, you know, smaller footprints, um, we are seeing a year-to-date price of about $22.40 for barley. And for rye, it's just under $8 a bushel. Um, and also keep in mind, this is all reported in U.S. dollars. Um, so moving ahead here. Oops. There we go. Um, to look at soybeans now. Um, so soybean production, this is where we saw a lot of that decline, which we're attributing directly to the import pressure. Um, so it declined by just below 7 million bushels. Um, this is kind of one of those instances now where 
this the imbalances of essentially supply demand and how consumption plays out is of kind of critical interest for tracking here um, especially in a time right now where we're seeing foreclosures again um, just to kind of reiterate that point um, it also really kind of throws the whole supply chain into, into a, a mix here um, so to, what to watch for essentially in 2020 and as we start to enter 2021 contracts um, I likely, I mean, we predict essentially at this point, we will see a bump in production, um, but we're also going to continue to see increased imports, um, and we think that they're going to start to extend out a little bit further here into to later months. Um, organic soybean prices, just to discuss this quickly as well, also stable. Um, so 1819, we saw about 1066 a bushel as a premium. You can see how this premium has essentially ebbed and flowed, or I'm sorry, the prices have ebbed and flowed over time. However, this premium, which is kind of that, that middle sector of this graph, continues to maintain, which is a fantastic indication for organic growers, uh, because this is another opportunity essentially to continue to kind of convert acres um, with the understanding that your risk exposure to price collapses, um, if that were to happen in, in, in any event, you would still actually be able to still capture a premium because consumers still value organic tremendously. Um, so this just kind of indicates essentially what we've seen. Uh, it, it, this is in the U.S. for the last you know five years roughly uh, with national organic soybean prices. So we still haven't seen you know those highs that we were seeing you know in 2015, um, but we are starting to now see price bumps occur as we're seeing more and more cons you know, consumer and supply surges. I'm sorry, not supply surges, demand surges. Um, so just to really quickly take a look now at soybean imports. Um, I you know, kind of hinted at this, but there has been a, a pretty big shift in momentum and where we're looking at essentially capturing these imports from. Um, so if you look here at the right hand side of this uh, slide, you'll see U.S. Uh, production versus what we're importing. Um, so U.S. production being about seven, you know, we're only essentially producing a little over seven million. Um, however, we are essentially then importing 80 percent of the remaining supply that is consumed in the U.S. Um, so this continues to be a big opportunity point for growers, uh, both in the U.S. and Canada as well. Um, so meal is kind of what the main driver is here again, looking back at livestock. Um, we saw increase and we continue to see increases in soybean meal imports into the U.S. as essentially it's shifted a little bit of a way from a crushing model and more of a reliance on the direct actual meal imports. <clears throat> um, so what to start to watch for now in 2020 and beyond? Um, you know, as this kind of heads, the U.S. economy has put a ton on the line for organics um, and is continuing to maintain that organic premium. Um, so while we don't really know how this is going to play out, you know, we're essentially starting to look at this right now as the COVID crisis. And then what's going to result from this is are we, are we going to potentially jump into a recession? That's sort of parts of the prediction that we're seeing here. And this would be a global you know, recession unlike anything we've ever seen. Um, so without fully being able to predict that, um, we do still think that we're going to see a fast escalation, um, essentially, of demand for organic goods. Um, as consumers kind of in this era right now are looking at, at health as kind of continuing to be a very big driver, um, with you know organic kind of starting to yield some of that promise. Um, so kind of bottom line, as I said at the very bottom of this, you know, organics are premium um, and the premium is good and the premium has maintained. So despite this kind of uncertain time, um, the organic um, <clears throat> drive is, is there. Consumers absolutely want this. Um, you know, in the past, as recessions hit, uh, consumers kind of dropped off from other um, goods that were kind of viewed as being not a necessity. Um, and 10 years ago, organic was very much in that space. However, we've definitely turned a corner at this point in time, and now organic is still considered you know, absolutely a necessity, especially as consumers value a lot of health. Um, I also want to kind of just address really quickly as well that while you know livestock feed demand numbers are down, a lot of that is directly attributed to essentially what we're seeing in the shift of consumer reliance on uh, essentially from being meat production to now plant-based proteins. 
a lot of that is being fed, of course, directly by you know, organic pea protein markets, um, but there's a lot of other market opportunities as well. And we continue to, to, to see that, that demand driver yield to more interesting crops kind of being folded into that mix. Um, so just, oh, sorry, skip me ahead here. So just a few things um, to know about marketing organics kind of in this uncertain time. Um, there's still a lot of competition from foreign, from foreign growers and foreign imports essentially coming into both the US and Canadian markets. Um, but most of the buyers that I talk to and that we all talk to um, tend to prefer all of their supply to be met within the US or Canada. Um, so that coupled with organic premiums maintaining it still is a fantastic time to be in organic production um, and even considering transitioning more acres at this point in time. Um, but knowing all of that, you need to know essentially where your local market lies. Um, you know, with smaller um, supply chains essentially and less processing facilities, it's very critical to essentially know what your local buyers are and what that market essentially is. Um, you know, this, the demand is still there. It's going to maintain. We don't see that shrinking anytime soon or at all, essentially, but just continuing to grow. Um, quality of products matters tremendously, though, um, and also having a really solid relationship with who your grain buyer is. Um, also exciting news. Um, for the first time ever, once we kind of re-ran some numbers, we noticed that, um, and this is very kind of U.S. centric, just keep that in mind, um, for, for years, essentially, we've always talked about U.S. organic production as being less than 1%. Um, however, uh, just within 2019 acreage updates that we've done recently, we noticed that organic acreage in the United States has actually surpassed the 1% mark, finally. Um, so we're at about 1.15% total U.S. acres being organic, which Again, not not gigantic, still very much so a drop in the bucket compared to conventional, but a hurdle nonetheless that we've overcome that we're very thrilled by. Um, so now a few things to essentially look at. Actually, I'm just going to skip right over this and go kind of into the COVID stuff. Um, because, you know, looking at 2021 now, um, you know, we're still seeing disruptions to the organic livestock, um, and we think that that will continue very much so. Um, you know, we saw a, a, a pork processing plant close down here because of the, the COVID scare. Um, so there are going to be some supply uh, shock surges here, and we think that they'll likely continue actually for the coming months. Um, so what that then means is that we're going to kind of look at different import models, um, and that's going to maintain both for the, the U.S. consumer as well as the Canadian consumer. Um, imports, you know, do potentially have this potential and fear around them um, because there's, you know, while this isn't necessarily substantiated at this point in time, it's a concern that essentially that could be a, a mechanism essentially for, you know, in, inducing additional uh, populations essentially to the COVID scare. Um, however, you know, just kind of thinking about that and what that really means, you know, that kind of means that down the supply chain, um, there's going to be more of a kind of a reliance on, on local farmers and local communities as well as to where people look to get their food. Um, there's also kind of a question of what's going to actually happen with long-term shifts and consumer preferences. Um, you know, since we're kind of at a, an era now where there's not a direct sell to, to restaurants anymore. Um, supply chains are, are being disrupted in the sense that they're not able to essentially sell into that, that direct market, um, which is kind of a, a huge negative essentially for a lot of organic produce producers. Um, it doesn't affect the organic um, grain producers as deeply. However, um, something to kind of note and see what happens. You know, surges in grocery sales are fantastic, um, but the, the depletion essentially of restaurant sales is a potential concern and something that I think um, is in the pipeline right now. We just haven't actually seen it come to life just yet. Um, so beyond that then, um, that's kind of the, the, the gist of it. Um, I will open this all up to questions because I think I'm at the, the top of my, my time allotment. Okay, thank you um, very much, Alex, for your presentation. Um, I have had um, a couple of questions. Sorry, <laughs> we're just oh. there. We go. Um, 
So the first question was, can you give me more detail on uh, the limited processing facilities? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when I say limiting processing facilities, I mean facilities that uh, are actually certified to handle organic and can do so. Um, so when we talk about limiting processing facilities, we really are saying that there's not as many local opportunities. Um, and so it's really critical essentially to kind of map out who actually is handling organic um, and where they're located in relation to you in particular. Um, so it's just a, a lack essentially of organic assets um, in both the US and Canada that results essentially in there being harder um, issues in marketing grain or getting grain services like cleaning, transportation, et cetera. Um, so it's just a, a smaller pool essentially to, to dip in. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you for that. And then uh, the other surprise, I think uh, for a few folks anyway, who um, directly uh, asked a question about it is the $18 oats that seems surprisingly high. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so that's, um, it's definitely food grade oats. Um, so to, to be very transparent about that. Um, so $18 oats, I mean, it's very much so kind of just more of a, a push. And that was an average essentially across, um, that was US and Canadian oats that we've captured thus far. Um, so while it seems a little high, we're seeing everything from about $24 on the food grade side down to about you know 16. So it really sort of depends. So that was a three month average price essentially from uh, so year to date. Um, so we're seeing January, February, March averaged out and that was essentially what we kind of saw across the US and Canada as a whole. Uh, on the feed grade side, you know, oats were significantly less. We saw everything from like $1.70 to like $9. Um, so it's a, oats are kind of an interesting thing because it's very much so kind of about local markets. Um, and there's only really a handful of, of companies that actually contract. I'm sure we can all name a few of them. Um, but yeah, that's essentially what we saw for food grade oats um, in 2020 at this point in time. Mm. Right, yeah, and I think there that might be one of the, uh, you know, a significant difference between the U.S. and and Canadian Canadian market um, around oats. But um, we have uh, grain millers on the line, so I'm sure they'll be responding uh, responding to that. Um, were there any other questions? I've just yeah, it was mostly around the the oat price, um, and then the question on processing. So. I haven't received any other. Oh, I do have one more question and we'll do this will be our last one. Um, it's do you see an oversupply in the organic marketplace? Uh, no, not at all, actually. Um, I, we do not currently see an oversupply. If anything, we see logistics issues that will yield supply, um, oversupply in certain areas, uh, but then major gluts in others. Um, where we tend to see a lot of oversupply tends to be in the non-GMO markets for transitional growers. Um, I know corn isn't very big, specifically in the prairie provinces, but that's one of the markets in particular that is so long that it tends to be very difficult to find a buyer and a premium for. Um, but for small grains, etc., in that transitional space, um, that tends to fare significantly better. Um, and there, as for like wheat, etc., like for a while we're seeing mills essentially being so full and not really wanting to do a lot of contracting however right now with there kind of being this, this surge essentially in demand a lot of it within wheat markets in particular um we're you know we're starting to now see more contracting start to come through despite these mills being full forever um as more and more consumers essentially reaching for things like pasta and bread etc so if anything i think that there's actually going to be more of an opportunity here mm -hmm. right Okay. Well, thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, Alex, for uh, being with us today and your presentation. Um, and with, with that, I am going to switch over to the grain buyer portion of uh, the webinar. And uh, first up is uh, F.W. Cobbs. So we'd like to welcome Ben Harrigan to the webinar. Over to you, Ben. Yes, thanks, Marla. And uh, just wanted to to thank you and Deb for uh, allowing us to have a few minutes, um, you know, to talk to uh, producers out there to um, 
you know, tell them more about uh, what we see going on in the markets right now and uh, trends that we see in the future. So uh, just wanted to start off by uh, telling you a little bit about uh, FW Cobbs. I'm one of the uh, merchandisers for the U.S. and Canada for FW Cobbs, and uh, we're a small family-owned company that started in 2006. Uh, we operate elevators in the United States and Canada. Um, one thing about us that I think makes us unique um, is that you know we do <clears throat> we do not import organic grain. Um, you know we try and keep our business local with uh, North American farmers, and uh, that's something that we were you know we started off as and something that we you know promised to to never change. So um, <clears throat> you know given the current climate, we feel it's more important than ever to be supporting local producers, and uh, we don't plan on changing that. I did just want to go through some of the questions here. Um, trends that we're seeing, uh, we're certainly seeing a demand increase for all organic feed grade grains. Uh, that's the primarily the primary market that we work in is feed grade grains and ingredients. So um, we've noticed an increase in that. You know, certainly um, given the COVID-19, we do have some concerns about you know the demand potentially slowing down. Um, in the short term, uh, long term though, the uh, outlook looks looks pretty strong for it. As uh, you know, we're starting to uh, hear from end users that we work with that the demand is increasing and they are buying more. So uh, certainly some positives there. <clears throat> um, question about organic imports. Um, you know, how are they affecting the marketplace? Um, you know, we're certainly seeing a you know, before the COVID-19 started, um, started to see the feed feed grade prices go down. And, you know, how we see it, uh, you know, we see corn as being uh, the main, in, main ingredient that tends to drive the price of all the other feed grade ingredients. Um, so when corn goes down, essentially, you're going to see the other um, feed grade ingredients price tend to drop as well. So, um, you know, the abundance of corn out there paired with the strong dollar, um, you know, certainly is a, um, makes it tough to, uh, uh, when the corn gets imported so cheap, makes it tough to be, um, you know, competitive and keep the price up in the, in the United States and in Canada. So that's kind of what we've seen over the past few months. Over the past few months. Um, also, um, Wanted to talk about some of the crops that we purchase um, in the U.S. Uh, tends to be mostly corn and soybeans. Um, in Canada, uh, we buy a lot of barley, buy rye, buy feed wheat, um, feed rye, and feed peas also, and some oats as well. And we also purchase a lot of organic screenings. Um, looking at some price indications now for spot contracts, new crop, um, we're looking anywhere between six fifty and seven dollars on barley. Uh, wheat, we're looking between seven dollars and fifty cents and eight fifty on wheat. Uh, rye, anywhere from six seventy five to eight dollars on rye. Um, screenings, anywhere from hundred and thirty to a hundred and fifty dollars a metric ton and then oats anywhere from three and a quarter to, to four dollars on oats um, please keep in mind you know we are looking at feed grade prices here um, so certainly um, I know a lot there's a lot of people that you know grow for food grade but these are um, feed grade prices so um, did want to open it up to any questions um, that anyone might have All right, thanks, Ben. Um, I've had a question. So it's how does your company work with farmers? Uh, what do you do for farmers? Um, and what are your payment terms? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, we do work, um, you know, as far as sponsoring a lot of different um, events or you know things like Sask Organics, um, you know a lot of different organizations that are that are out there trying to grow organic farming. You know we're big uh, big sponsors in every in a lot of those areas. Um, also, um, 
we do, you know, put on some some field days as well um, through FW Cobbs. Um, as far as payment terms go for us, um, you know, I think we're some of the leaders in the industry as far as prompt payment goes. Um, you know, typically, payments go out, you know, within the week that the grain's received. Um, then we overnight for uh, Canadian producers overnight the checks to our Lorburn facility, and then they go out via regular mail there. But uh, you know, given the, given the circumstances of the COVID-19, certainly uh, we try and be as flexible as we can. You know, if somebody's in a pinch where they would need something wired to them or direct deposit, ACH debit, you know, we have uh, certainly try and be creative and flexible for our producers to make sure that they get the payment when they need it. So. Um, Okay, that, that's great. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and then the other question, uh, another question I've had is, do you have an act of God clause in your in your uh, contract? Yeah, great question. So um, we do. And, um, you know, being a smaller, you know, family owned business, I, I feel like we do have a lot of flexibility where, um, you know, we, we tell the producers to, 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 write in whatever clause or if there's something that they don't like you know let's talk about it let's talk about what you like in the contract let's talk about what you don't like and uh you know let's you know ultimately we want to make sure that our producers feel comfortable doing business with us so if there's something that needs to get added or they want to get added or taken out um you know we typically honor that so uh we're no problem with uh, any type of act of god clause or anything like that the conversation Thank you for um, having me. i really appreciate it yeah absolutely for sure and we really appreciate you coming on and, and sharing sharing your your prices and your thoughts um on the market all right so we are going to move on uh to on our next speaker our next speaker uh which is grain miller so i'm we're handing it over to scott Scott Shields, sorry, from, from Gray Miller. You may be having technical difficulties with audio. Uh, Scott, we can't hear you. Um, okay, I think while we're kind of trying to figure that out, we're going to move on to the next, uh, the next buyer, which is a Manitoba Harvest, and we have uh, Daryl McElroy um, on the line. And Daryl, you'll have to un, un oh, there we go. Yeah, He's unmuted sure. himself. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so yeah. much. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks very much for uh, putting this um, this together for us. Um, uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk on it. Uh, I'm going to try to put most of my questions into uh, or answer most of my questions into uh, what I'm going to say here. So uh, I guess at the end of the time, if I don't answer, if there needs some clarifications, we'll we'll go through that. But um, Anyhow, yes, fresh hemp food. We've been in production here for the last 20 years. Um, we've gone through a couple of different uh, organization moves as far as owners. Uh, you know, from since 2015, we were bought by Compass Diversified Holdings, and they bought both fresh hemp or Manitoba Harvest and Hemp Hole Canada, and we're now operating underneath. The heading fresh hemp foods. We are the largest hemp food producer in the world. We are basically a seed to shelf type operation. We are an exclusively an industrial hemp grain company. We do not have our hemp products. We do have our hemp products in granola cereals and granola bars, uh, and we do have new protein powders of a hemp and pea protein blend. But we get both of our granola and pea protein from a second party. We've had our best first quarter ever in both organic and conventional hemp food sales this year. Our online sales have been crazy high, both on Amazon and on the Walmart site. 
our big organic news is that we're supplying Costco USA with all their organic hemp food needs. We also have made, just made a deal with a, to supply a nationwide retail store for all of their organic and conventional hemp food needs. As a result, this, is, this will be the first year we've had more organic contracted production than conventional. Our sales and marketing teams have done such a great job in developing old markets and finding new markets that it's been tough to get enough contracted organic acres to supply that demand. That being said, we still take both organic and conventional contracts. We have four production contracts, basis clean seed to our food grade standards. We are currently paying our organic contracts $1.48 a pound that meet these 99.9% .9 pure uh, standards. Our contracts do have a NAFTA of God clause, and uh, we, to, to meet these standards, we do have all of our farmers uh, take a good agricultural collection practices course. Uh, we supply lots of advice on how to keep your grain clean as soon as it's in your combine hopper until it leaves the grower's yard. Conventional, if there's any conventional uh, growers out there, yeah, we're still uh, looking for some conventional acres too, and we're around the 60 cent a pound range. Now we get to the COVID-19. <clears throat> so far, we haven't seen an issue. Like uh, Everybody's been saying so far, uh, the sales have been up. Maybe that's had something to do with our best first quarter ever. Um, but uh, yeah, we haven't seen a, a decline. In fact, anything, if anything, it's getting stronger. Uh, just another little update of what's going on in our our production um, facilities, which are both in Manitoba, and you know, which is really great because uh, Manitoba actually still only has four, 246 confirmed cases. So uh, we were pretty fortunate in that way. Um, yeah, all of our office employees though are all working from home, and in our processing facilities. We are still take, we are still processing, taking precautions to keep a safe distance from each other. But really, our operation people are very very safe due to the amount of food safety precautions we have in place. <clears throat> Lots of hand washing, face masks, clean fresh smocks, hair, etc. We think that the COVID has helped sales for now, and but hopefully the sales keep on going up, and COVID disappears as soon as possible. As far as um, the impact of imports, that's what hemp imports um, are very, very low coming from, from any country. Uh, we have such a demand now, uh, and that excludes the United States because we have such a demand now, we are reaching out to uh, growers in the United States for organic production. Uh, just to give you a little bit of an idea where we contract from, uh, we go, as far west as the Canadian Rockies, uh, and as far up uh, in Alberta to La Crete, so that's a fair distance away from us. And uh, we're pulling into as far east as uh, we have a in the Lac Saint Jean area of Quebec. We uh, kind of that circle. So if you draw a circle around where Manitoba or Winnipeg is, and draw a circle now, we don't have to quit at the U.S. border. We're taking those uh, northern states also. Um, yeah, and that's about it. And again, I want to thank you very, very much for this opportunity to, to uh, talk about hemp a little bit. And yeah, and then the great market and the demand for organic is, I concur, is, is, uh, is increasing all the time. So now, that's any great. Questions thank you. Now? That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Daryl. Are, are there any questions uh, from Manitoba Harvest? Uh, so, I do have one question. The hemp prices you quoted, dollar per pound, minus cost of trucking to grain cleaner, and then minus cost of cleaning, is that is that the the price that you quoted? I guess then is that called net. Okay, so uh, that price is based on on the clean seed, and what we do for right. the farmer or with with the farmer. Um, we pay the long haul from the cleaner or the long haul between the farmer and the cleaner, which is ever closest. So if a farmer, let's say, is in, um, oh, I guess we have a, a cleaner up in Cherry River. So if 
the farmer is producing it. Let's say one of our best producers is at, at Shelbrook. So <clears throat> from Shelbrook to Carrot River, it's not that far. That's the farmer's. Um, the, the, the farmer has to pay. That's his, uh, what he has to do is to get that there. And then from Carrot River to one of our facilities here in the Winnipeg area, uh, that's our that's our cost. So okay. they go through actually a lot of, uh, because it's a, such a raw food product, basically the way we tell our farmers is whatever comes into that, uh, you know, out of your bin, uh, you're, you're going to be feeding that raw to your family. So you have to take, you know, pretty good control or care of, of your product in the bin. So we do a lot of testing. <clears throat> Once it's been dried and conditioned and in this, you know, dried being, uh, less than 9% moisture, uh, we get asked for a sample and we do some testing and there's lots of biological testing, uh, uh, internal seed color, meat, so, you know, hemp heart colors, everything's good. Then uh, at our call, we will tell them and we tell them which cleaner that we want to take it to um, because they are all of our cleaners, anyhow, are uh, you know, has or has some kind of food processing uh, background. So then, uh, once it gets to, the, gets to the the cleaner, it's cleaned. We test it again, <clears throat> and then it, if it's everything's still okay, it goes on a truck, comes into our facility. We test it again. <laughs> if it's mm -hmm. uh, still still uh, still good, then we prop at that time. Then we'll cut the check for. What that um, for that net weight that comes in on the truck. So All right. what that means, uh, you know, you got roughly around a hundred thousand pounds on a B train. We like using B trains. Um, that takes a lot of um, that takes a lot of trust. That uh, you know, you're watching mm -hmm. that that hundred thousand pounds at a dollar fifty go out to your uh, go drive out your lane, and you're not going to probably get a month uh, a check for for a good month. But uh, again, we've been in this business for the last 20 years, and I think we've had a pretty good. I think we've had a pretty good. Uh, I think we've had a pretty good uh, reputation that we've uh, come to so far in the last couple of years. Right. Well, thank you for that, Jill. I have I have another question. Um, have you seen an increase in acres in Lac Saint Jean, Quebec? We. They're coming towards us, yes, for certainly we have, yes. Um, there was uh, another company that was contracting out of that Lac Saint Jean area that have kind of they've kind of faded away a little bit. Um, I don't know what their internal. Well, I know the, the gentleman that was running that uh, that company was uh, stepping back, and again, it's just as uh, they just kind of faded. So our acres have increased. Okay, um, and do you currently have uh, any contracts available? Yes, we do. Yeah, just uh, you got our contact information there on the screen, and yeah, my phone number here is, uh, in case somebody isn't watching it on the screen, is uh, 204-823-2898. So that's 204-823-2898. Okay, and maybe our last question, um, can you uh, tell us uh, some of the challenges of growing hemp? You... How much time do we have? <laughs> yeah, I know that's what I thought. That's not a good question to end on, is it? That's that's a that's a webinar on its own, I think. <laughs> Pretty much, though. So, you know, the biggest problem uh, traditionally has, has been the combines, and the combines um, have. Uh, at least the newer ones, and I would say uh, going back eight years and up, it's you know you can basically walk into any kind of uh, any kind of uh, hemp crop and with slight minor uh, altercations, you, you, it, it would ultimately it would uh, you wouldn't have any problem. Uh, it's all about timing. Um, you know, the longer it stays out there, the drier it gets. Uh, certainly, the more problems you're going to have. Uh, but yeah, we one of our varieties is uh, called Fanola, and it's the earliest maturing variety. Um, doesn't grow tall, so yeah, it's uh, it's 
uh, the most popular variety in Canada. And uh, yeah. So yeah, if yeah, okay. the person that said that, if they want to give me a call, we can go through that. We have a really good agronomy package put together, and we can cover anything that uh, anything from from you know um, field preparation, field selection, all the way to storage in your bin. We actually put out uh, five different grower tips throughout the year, uh, helping the farmers, you know, as either if they're experienced as a reminder or if they're new. Just giving them uh, a little bit of an update. All right. Well, there you've actually prompted quite quite a few uh, questions, uh, Daryl. So there's uh, some interest for sure. So for the questions that didn't get answered, I'm sorry about that. But please do give Daryl uh, Daryl a call or uh, send him an email, um, and he'll be able to to help you out. So thank you very much, Daryl. And we're going to now go uh, back to uh, grain millers. And we have Scott now ready uh, to do his bit. All right, and now I hope. I'm sort of you. Are you guys there? Oh, sorry, I, I'm like, hey, what happened to the screen? Yeah, we can see your, we can see your desktop. <laughs> Yes, thanks. Uh, you can hear me this time. We can. Thank you. Yeah. No, that was we we had actually muted all of the panelists, so I think that's what the confusion was there. So, um, well, welcome, gonna, Scott. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having Grain Millers, you guys. Thanks for putting this together. Um, we've actually been doing quite a bit of uh, our meetings uh, using different uh, Microsoft Zoom or Teams, uh, I guess it is, and um trying to get together right i mean that's the big thing these days and uh this is fantastic uh, uh i guess a little bit about grain millers uh, most people do um in organic growers and especially in saskatchewan do know who we are but uh, grain millers canada um, has been around since around 2001 when grain millers inc our parent company out of the u.s bought a small oatmeal uh, here in Yorkton, uh, which has uh, grown uh, nearly, I think, tenfold now uh, in the past 20 years, nearly 20 years. Um, we just are, uh, have completed a, a $100 million expansion. We put a, built a second mill. Um, I think we're on our, our fourth warehouse, um, expanding like, like crazy, largely in part to do two things like organic and um, the more specialty things. Um, so uh, we have the, the mill in Yorkton. We also have a um, an elevator facility, handling facility in Rycroft, Alberta, which is up north of Grand Prairie. And we have a flax facility in Saskatoon that we've had for about five years. Uh, so I guess uh, the, the, the big trend we're seeing this year, what we're really noticing is a um, a drop in, in prices from more traditional prices over the last decade. Uh, it, a lot of that's due to supply, uh, both in uh, due to more acres in organic, but also due to organic growers uh, doing a better job, uh, growing better yields of, of the crops they're doing and um, better quality of them. So um, us as, a, uh, as the largest organic oat milling company in the world, um, you know, we are, we are food grade focused. Uh, we look at, um, we, as feed, a lot of our feed stuff is on the side. So I do, I'm going to pose a couple questions out. Uh, I, I might seem a little thrown off <laughs> and I am, uh, partly due to the quotes, uh, from Alex's presentation in the 18 to $22 range for, for food grade oats. Um, I've already fielded a number of uh, emails and text messages since that part of his presentation, uh, some from our company, but some also from a bunch of producers. So, um, you know, grain millers being uh, where we are in that industry, I think, I, I think there's, there's some numbers we need to discuss uh, as um, we've never paid anywhere near that for any of our, our organic feed grade oats, so or food grade oats for me. Um, so we'll get to that, I guess, uh, in a minute. We're, uh, with the COVID 
thing, it, it's funny. We've seen an, actually an increase in um, customer orders coming to us, uh, or maybe not so much new orders, but push on that. Uh, we're we've sent as as you can see. I'm not in my office. Um, I'm in my home office now. Uh, but we've sent uh, staff home to work from home, and we're actually hiring to push orders uh, faster out the back end of our place as store shelves need to be stocked. Um, so I think, you know, short term, we're seeing a real nice blip in demand. Uh, but a lot of that demand seems to be just customers pushing orders faster, uh, not necessarily new sales on, on product going out the back. Uh, some companies might be seeing that and, and we may see that and, and great if it continues. Uh, we would love to, uh, to continue at this pace. It's kind of fun when you're out there at a time of year when you're normally a little bit quieter going into seating uh, with, with activity picking up. That's great. Um, so our, our big two, I guess in Canada, our big two uh, crops that we purchase are oats obviously and flax is our second biggest now up here. Um, we've uh, we've really in, tried to increase that business it's a nice fit uh, it's a nice fit agronomically for growers as well in saskatchewan especially they can you can uh, produce really nice flax crops and we're seeing more or, uh, organic producers out of alberta that are trying to grow uh, flax now which is great to see uh, expand that uh, that footprint for flax um, expand our buying area as well um, we do uh, in the U.S., we we mill a lot more uh, of the other crops. So we we mill some wheat, uh, soft white uh, wheat being the the biggest one I think for us. Uh, we do a little bit of milling barley. We do some rye, triticale. Um, we do have plants down in the states that do uh, organic and non-GMO corn and organic and non-GMO soybeans as well. So uh, we are we're a lot more diverse, I guess, down there, um, and uh, but those crops are being grown more down there, as you can see from Alex's uh, presentation. Um, with the uh, prices for right now, so like I said, we're not we're not 18 or or 22 dollars a bushel for our organic oats. Uh, we do have some some space still for summer. Uh, we're buying a little bit of old crop organic uh, oats at five and a quarter, delivered to Yorkton here, um, which is uh, is traditionally a little bit lower. Uh, you know, we've we've probably for the last five, six, seven years been right in that. You know, six has kind of probably been the the number that guys have seen mostly. And uh, to see it down a little bit lower has been a little bit of a shock to the system. But um, it's it's still supply and demand, so we we are seeing more supply with acres and and better crops. Uh, for flax, we do have some new crop contracts available. Uh, oats, we will have some more new crop contracts available as well. We just don't have any right now. Um, but for flax, we are uh, $31 a bushel picked up for organic brown flax and um, $36 a bushel for yellow. Uh, and those are picked up. Um, we do have Act of God uh, on all of our organic contracts, so I'll preempt that question. And um, yeah, I don't know if I really have much. I, I had more stuff, and I kind of I did. I sidetracked myself and uh, a little bit with some questions uh, that I had, I guess. Um, yeah, I, I think that's it for me. No, that's that's perfect, uh, Scott. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, the intention certainly uh, wasn't to throw you by the first presenter. That's for sure. <laughs> Um, uh, you know, thank you, you know, thank you for being on the call and, you know, again, thank you to Grain Millers for the leadership they show uh, in the organic sector here in the province and, and across the country. So we really, you know, we, we appreciate that. And, and I think this is uh, providing an opportunity maybe to have a, a conversation with Alex um, after just to, to drill down a little bit more in, into those, you know, into those numbers um, to see uh, where, you know, where, where they were, they were coming from. I mean, I've, I've worked um, in the organic sector uh, in the province for um, uh, almost 14 years now, and I've never seen uh, an oat price, even even at the the heady heights of the market, um, that high. So um, I think it you know it just provides an opportunity for us to you know to have a conversation after the call and just um, see you know see where those how how they're you know 
this is where the numbers came from and, and we can share that information out with folks who are on the webinar today. All right, so moving on and again, um, if if we didn't get to your questions, uh, please do uh, reach out, uh, as, as you already are doing, uh, to Scott uh, and his colleagues at Grain Millers, and, and they'll be able to, uh, to answer uh, your questions and hopefully contract some grain with them. All right, so as with all of the buyers, I hope you follow up and, and you get some contracts um, uh, with them. So we're moving on now to um, Alex Galarno with PHS Organics. Thank you so much, Alex, for uh, being a part of the call or the webinar. Uh, thank you, and, and thank you, uh, Organic Connection, uh, South Organics, for putting this on. This is uh, very helpful in these uh, trying times. Uh, we're learning a lot. Uh, this might be the new norm of communicating, and for us, uh, 98 uh, viewers, I think, are on the on the web webinar right now, it's it might be a new way to get information. So, uh, Prairie Heritage Seeds is very happy to be part of this uh, inaugural uh, presentation and uh, hopefully we'll see more of this coming up in the future. Uh, Prairie Heritage Seeds, uh, who are we, what are we? Um, I'm Alex Galarno, I'm the uh, one of the owners of uh, Prairie Heritage Seeds. Uh, I come into this industry, I'm a farmer, organic farmer, have been for 35 years. I've uh, been in the industry uh, buying and selling for about 30 years. Uh, it's a family run organization, started from my father, um, and our primary uh, market right now is Europe. We export most of our commodities uh, to Europe, a uh, little amount in, in Canada, but our main focus is on Europe. Um, and for those who don't know us, uh, we're prime, we are the exclusive commute, uh, processor for a commute in Canada and the contractor. Um, we we are very big supporters of the organic industry. We Financially, we have supported the Prairie Organic Directive, uh, Sask Organics, Organic Connections. Uh, we, are, we support all the local or, uh, food banks. And uh, we are a member of the checkoff uh, for the Sask, Organ uh, Sask Organics. Um, I do believe that our, our industry needs a voice and uh, and uh, this checkoff is a small little uh, price that every farmer can contribute. And uh, we're asking our growers to participate. And uh, of course it's voluntary, uh, but it, it has some good, good effects. So going forward, we will continue to do that and support the industry. Also, we, we have for our growers a scholarship for anyone who is going to university of their children. Uh, we, we supply a thousand dollar scholarship for the first year of, of, uh, of our com uh, growers and we're proud to do that and we've over the last uh, number of years we spent over a hundred thousand dollars in scholarships to our growers and it's a way of prayer heritage is giving back. Um, so what do we do here? Uh, we contract grain, uh, full production contracts. Uh, we, we buy uh, Kamut, who's our main one, uh, flax, brown and yellow. Uh, we are also uh, pushing our envelope a little bit. We're getting into the lentils and uh, it, it, all different kinds of lentils and uh, feed grain. Uh, we have an excellent team uh, that we have developed over the last four years. Uh, Gord Crone, who is the card there we see below, he's our grains procurement officer. Uh, if you have any grain to sell, please contact Gord or any contracts uh, interest. Uh, please contact Gord. Uh, we have a, our sales office out of Montreal who's doing fantastic work exploring new new uh, opportunities and we're going to go forward. What I've seen in 30 years, uh, just where we are today, I, I'm very positive. Um, I've been quoted to say uh, to organic farmers, uh, buy a pair of sunglasses because the future does look bright and I really do mean that. Um, in 2008, we, we almost hit the the biggest financial crisis of the world I've ever seen. Um, per Heritage Seeds' is, uh, sales went up 30% in the, in the worst financial situation that we, we could have been in. Um, not counting COVID-19, we've seen our sales increase since October. We've been on an uptrend before even COVID-19. Now COVID-19, we've seen an uptake. We do believe that is just temporary little blip, um, just 
our customers are looking to fill their warehouses to make sure that uh, they have a good supply. Uh, we'll probably see the demand level up, but again, Prairie Heritage Seeds, we have seen our, our, our demand increase since October. So we're still looking uh, for new more growers. We've also uh, take, taken on a few more customers. Uh, we're expanding globally where our sales and into some very, very exciting markets. And we're going to be looking for a new product. Uh, one of them right now we're looking for is high, high protein spring wheat. If anybody has some, please call Gord and you can discuss the pricing and the quality. Uh, and go forward. Yeah, so I, I, I'm very positive about the organic industry. Um, and the $18 oats, wow, that's a heck of a price. Uh, of course, the devil will be in the details. And I think there was uh, some misunderstanding on how we sell oats out here in, in Western Canada and how uh, it's been recorded. So the devil will be in the details. I, I ask farmers not to, uh, to to look, ask ask questions about that before we, we say that that's the, the price that it should be sold at. Um, going forward, um, we are closing our commute contracts. Uh, we have just a, a few more acres left. So if anybody's interested, please contact us immediately because those that door is actually closing quite quickly. Uh, I think we've maybe got about three, 4,000 acres left to contract. And then, then after that, the door will be closed. Um, and yeah, that's about all I can say. And again, thank you, Marla. Oh, thank, thank you, Alex, and a big thank you to Deb because she is, she is uh, the one who has uh, worked super hard in this last couple of weeks to get this together. So I always like to thank her publicly for um, all of the, the work that she's doing to keep keep us uh, going here on on the education program front. So um, thank you for that. I do have a couple of questions. Um, one uh, is Alex, uh, what do you see this year in lentil markets, and do you have any? Uh, lentil contracts and while we're on the lentils are you buying black lentils that was a separate question yes uh, we, we are going to be buying lentils we are not contracting lentils uh, we are only spot buying uh, lentils our market is Europe the problem with lentils in Europe is is glyphosate testing mm -hmm. um, we have a full uh, fully staffed lab here however we don't do the pesticide testing in in-house so the lentils have to be third-party tested for lentils, and then we can probably sign up a deal. Uh, black lentils will be purchasing this fall, um, and it will be at market price. And just what we're seeing now, the um, the demand will be higher than what we have seen in the past. So yes, we will be buying it. Okay, no, that's that's good to hear. Um, thank you so much. Um, oh, and uh, I guess that the other um is on uh, french green lentils do you do you see do you think do you have a market for those in Absolutely. the fall as well yeah okay the two the two mark the two lentils that seem to be taken off for prairie heritage seeds uh we're getting some very good traction on the black and the, the french greens and uh, if anybody has some out there uh, please submit samples uh again we're selling it to europe it must be pesticide residue tested but uh, after all that is done i think it's worthwhile uh uh, doing and uh, moving forward and it opens up another market. Okay, no, that sounds great. And uh, one more question here. Uh, do you have pricing for uh, brown flax, golden flax and Kamut? Yes, okay, so brown flax currently we're at the $33 uh, spot buy. Um, and yellow flax were just under the $40 mark, uh, 38, 39. And then the Kamut, Commute pricing you know, will have to be explained. Mm -hmm. Commute pricing right now is at eighteen dollars a bushel as a floor price. We we have uh, always had a floor price. We always reserve the right to raise that price at any time and have in the past four years. Um, we we were anticipating a uh, market correction earlier in January, which didn't realize. So we probably will see the, the contract price uh, move up and that will be retroactive uh, to everybody who signed the contract. So kind of unique on that. We're proud of the commute contract. It's uh, a contract written by farmers for farmers and uh, it works very well. Uh, it's very flexible and all the time when we go 
uh, on these things, there's a little issue, we will change that contract to, to, uh, to help the farmer. So that's where we're at. Okay, that's that's really great. Thank you uh, again, Alex, for uh, being a part of uh, our webinar today. And we're going to move on now to yes, yes. Uh, pipe, Pipeline Foods. Um, welcome, yeah, that's Jason that's Charles. Really the first step is So, Jason, can you just check to yeah, uh, make sure that you're coming in on a regular basis? Mike is green, and Northwest, we are Northwest and hearing yeah. some background yeah. noise about trucks coming in. <laughs> oh, there we go. There you go. How's that, Jason? Can you hear me? Ah, here we are. We got you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Good stuff. You bet. Well, morning, everybody. Uh, Jason Charles. Uh, I'm one of the three founders of Pipeline Foods for a little over three years here now. Okay, yeah, I will um, work for your sample, and then we we're uh, we're growing pretty uh, um, pretty extensively. Uh, yeah, our yeah. goal was to do so. Uh, today, we're about 13 facilities uh, between Canada and the United States. Um, a majority of our business is, uh, as far as Northern Tier, is all small grains, it's, uh, and it's, uh, it's Western Canada, yeah, uh, Canadian, Canadian and U.S. Okay, home. Uh, talk to you later. Bye. And um, uh, grains that we focus on is uh, uh, milling, uh, a lot of food, actually. So spring, uh, hard red spring, uh, soft white, durum, uh, some barley, flax a lot of oats um and then uh uh yellow peas uh is a big business for us as well uh top three would definitely be a hard red spring um peas oats and and uh and uh and barley and, and soft white so um i'm also a farmer i'm, I'm from Saskatchewan originally. Uh, I've been in the organic space now for a little over 25 years. Uh, we farmed down the southeast corner. Um, prior to 25 years ago, we were conventional and made the switch on, on all 12,000 acres there. And um, we certainly haven't looked back. Uh, all the folks on the phone, um, you know, over the years, we've, we've certainly worked together. And, uh, and the work that Marlon and Deb do as well, bringing groups like this together. Um, Going into the, going into you know this spring and uh, and new crop fall, uh, we've been very busy. Uh, seems like the consensus on the phone is most are and um, twofold. I think that's both demand and is is driving higher. But uh, you know as it relates around this whole COVID thing, uh, that's certainly causing you know flour, pasta, breads, and so forth to uh, to be bought and stored and and so forth. So we are seeing a little uptick there. Um, and uh, as pipeline, we're we're certainly busy buying uh, hard red spring oats and, and yellow peas right now uh, through August, and uh, all all milling or food grade spec. And uh, we're not doing a bunch of feed right now. Uh, we've kind of got our belly full with feed, uh, just given the, the the sheer amount out there. Um, and as we get into new crop, uh, you know, we have uh, Act of God production contracts out there now. We've we've uh, we've bought a lot of grain September uh, 2020 through uh, through July of 21. Uh, we continue to stand in there and continue to buy um, at uh, at relative prices. Um, everybody on the phone, uh, you know, in in certain respects, where uh, we are on 10-year lows. You know, I I remember plenty of years where, and everybody on the phone would where we're you know the market is 17 to 20 dollar a week and so on and so forth and uh those markets uh we always have to stay relative maintain and build our market share at the store shelf for the consumer uh twofold two and a half fold is is kind of a max number versus our conventional counterparts and um and we're, we're able to do that um you know th this year uh you know painting a picture i don't think it's a bad picture from a from a demand perspective in fact we're seeing we're seeing wonderful demand from a pricing perspective, uh, just given what we're all going through with this whole COVID thing, um, oversupply of conventional grain uh, as it relates to, to feed and protein with, with corn and beans and, and hard red winter in the, in the U.S. Um, you know, we're, we're going to have to stay relative. I don't see a lot of upside potential 
this COVID thing with, you know, upwards of 20 million people filing unemployment in the U.S. over the last three weeks, uh, $20 crude, uh, natural gas, gasoline, ethanol demand down, you know, 5 million barrels a day. Um, there's, uh, uh, there's going to be a, a fallout from that. And I, I just don't think going forward that that warrants, you know, seven, six or $7 or $5 or $4 conventional corn or, or, uh, or 15 or $16, uh, 13 per week, but crystal ball stuff. Uh, one good thing though, if you want to sell organic grains today, all 12 or 12 or 14, we produce in Western Canada for all intents and purposes, you can. And uh, I think that's the goal of every buyer on the phone is make sure they're, you know, we're all there every day to make sure we're supplying opportunity and optionality to make sure we can get stuff to town. Um, as far as uh, one of the questions here, as far as imports impacting the market, um, as Canadians, um, I don't see it impacting us from, a, you know, where wheat farmers, small grains and pulses. Um, there's, there, certainly there's a lot of wheat producers around the world. But when it comes to our certain qualities uh, that we're able to produce uh, and close destinations to the lower 48, uh, no one can be more competitive than what the, what the Western Canadian producer can be. Um, certainly affects us in the protein space, and and uh, everybody's heard the heard the horror stories as it relates to organic feed corn coming into the U.S., which um, has been slowing, and uh, we are seeing that impact. Uh, it's just we, we there's a lot of corn in the lower 48. Um, I touched on COVID. It's, it's, uh, you know, we're, we're all critical business, uh, especially the farmer, the trucker, the green buyer, and uh, getting food and feed to town. And, um, it's assisting all of us today from a demand perspective. Uh, impacting our, con our company, uh, you know, it's, uh, really the only, the only real impacts is, uh, getting used to, to Zoom and webinar meetings and, and make sure that we're, we're communicating externally and internally. Uh, export paperwork um, out of Western Canada uh, is, is certainly uh, a little bit more in depth now versus uh, 30 days ago. And probably the biggest impact that uh, as an exporter of, Canadi of Western Canadian organics uh, with the size of our export programs, uh, especially as it relates to wheat and pulses, is um, when our neighbors across the pond uh, aren't working or working docks or unloading boats, those boats don't come home or back to us. And it creates a significant logistics jam uh, given our two, you know, our only, you know, our, our one opportunity to, to, to export grains out of Western Canada, and that's essentially Vancouver. Those vessels don't come in, those con empty containers don't come back. Hence, we're not loading 20-foot containers and, and loading vessels as fast as we want to and, and get that green out of the country. Um, couple that with East-West Railroads, CNCP. Um, we're, we're just on CP. Uh, they've actually done a really good job as of late, but given the COVID deal uh, out, out on the West Coast, uh, we are seeing uh, more embargoes than not here the past 30 days just with congestion uh, at ports and due to vessels not coming in. As far as uh, pro uh, you know, uh, crops, commodities that we're in every day, um, a lot of spring wheat, soft white, barley, rye, uh, brown flax, feed barley, feed wheat, uh, a lot of milling oats, um, anything that we produce in, in Western Canada. Small markets for us is certainly flax, uh, lentils, green peas, um, but everything else is in volume with, I mentioned the top three of spring wheat and, and peas and oats. Um, as far as specialty niche crops, we do quite a bit of organic pet food, and um, as a niche as that is, um, it's uh, it's lentils and and green peas, a lot of oats actually, a lot of a lot of yellow peas. Um, niche stuff is mostly uh, stuff that we don't grow in Canada. We do, maybe just not enough of it, or there's you know there's other countries that are are doing it cheaper and, and they're bringing it in, you know, as far as quinoa goes and, and amaranth and, and red fife, really small volume, but niche type stuff. We do touch that. Um, and uh, as far as uh, contracts, yes, we do uh, uh, act to God and um, there's no volume too small or too large that uh, we won't do uh, when, when we're, uh, as it relates to, to spring wheat and, and, uh, and peas, no. 
uh, within races. And um, as far as, you know, uh, all our contracts, as far as wheat goes, it's, it's all 13 Pro milling quality, 300 falling number type stuff, but certainly have uh, programs for the lower pro and, and higher pro as well. And that's all in, our, all in our contracting system. So I urge you, anybody interested that doesn't know us or, or talk to us, please give me a call, give Lauren a call, give Steve a call, and uh, um, we'll, uh, we'll get your questions answered. Uh, everybody's touched on Alex's oats. Only thing I could offer there is, is uh, possibly Alex was talking uh, 100 weight versus, uh, versus uh, price per bushel. Uh, that would make uh, quite a bit more sense. Uh, other than that, uh, that's all I have. Any questions? Thanks. Thanks so much, Jason. Jason, and thanks for the the insight into the discrepancy in uh, pricing as well. That that might be it. Um, so I just had one question asking if you could go into a little bit more detail on what you're contracting right uh, right now, or what you're buying on the spot market. Um, and prices? Sure. Um, so as it relates to uh, old crop, so we'll just call old crop April 15, uh, July 15. Um, milling quality for uh, 13 uh, min, I'll call it min 12, 5, 13 pro milling quality wheat. Uh, as we're, we're, we're buying as much as we can, we can find um, and 13, 5 moisture. Um, old crop peas, yellow peas, um, quality wise, uh, just a number two, not 14, five water, uh, so forth, uh, through, uh, through July one. And, uh, we'll see how fast we get filled up, but for, for this phone call is as much as we can buy. And, uh, we're also buying, uh, near term rye and, uh, that stuff is actually has caught quite a bit. It's up it's between 11, and 12 bucks. Spring wheat, anywhere from you know, of course, everything we do is is picked up. So depending where you're at, you know, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Alberta, and and what area, but call it Saskatchewan spring wheat, uh, picked up anywhere from you know, 1350 to 1450. Uh, peas, um, depending where you're at, um, anywhere from you know, northern Alberta. Uh, with the tan in front of it to to Silty, Saskatchewan with the uh, you know, with a with the 14 in front of it. So um, and uh, yeah, soft white currently no bid right now. We uh, we just finished uh, a big buying program, bought a bunch of it, and uh, oats. Um, we're uh, we're still buying old new and old crop oats, and that depending where you're at, anywhere from five to five seventy five. And again, everything we do is picked up. So sorry, I take myself off mute there. Um thank you for that. And just uh, maybe one more question and then we'll uh, move on to our last but not least uh presenter. Um what what are your what are your payment term terms on contracts? Yeah. Uh we're we're always net twenty one. Um, 21 days is what we do and uh, we tried in that 14 days for quite some time um, but it's just you know given our footprint and by the time we get paid forth through the system I just don't want to you know we as a company don't want to under under you know over promise and under deliver and uh, if we can just stick to 21 days um, it seems like we, we've had the most success there and uh, you know, as a, as a grower, you know, you always want the optionality to get paid on the scale and, and what have you. And, and if that was an absolute must, then I guess we'd have to figure something out. But for all intents and purposes, she's net 21 days. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks again, uh, Jason, for uh, taking part today. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, and we're going to uh, move on uh, to, like I said, our last but not least uh, presenter from Seaboard uh, Special Crops and William Duncan is going uh, to talk a little bit about their company and they're a relatively uh, newcomer to uh, the organic sector in Saskatchewan. So welcome, uh, William. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, just uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank uh, uh, SAC Organics for, and all of you guys in attendance today for the opportunity to speak. Uh, as as uh, Marla said, we are fairly new in the organic market. 
uh, but we are a 100-year-old company. Uh, our head office is based out of Regina, Saskatchewan, uh, and our, our certified organic plant is here in Avonlea, where I am today. Uh, we also have flour mills all over the world and hope to, uh, and hope to be our own end user uh, on, this, uh, on this organic mission that we're on. Uh, and with that, our mission is global reach with local focus. Uh, what our plants are, what our plant in Avonlea is set up to handle right now is mostly pulse crops. Uh, so we are going to be uh, looking to move uh, lentils, red, uh, green lentils, small and large, uh, French greens, and black lentils. Uh, we're also, we've also been moving some yellow peas, uh, trying to get some interest in movement in green peas and maples as well as well as with uh, with some new uh, with some new farming techniques uh, we're hope and uh, have seen some success out of the Manitoba area in chickpeas grown organically uh, our plant is also set up to hand or to clean baba beans as well uh, and with that we also have been buying a bit of feed wheat uh, again with the current situation uh, the market is is a little bit slower uh, just as I say in 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 economics uh when uh, when the when the economy is is a little uh is a little sluggish uh the first uh the first thing that we that seems to take a hit is is how we eat uh uh but also in saying that i do believe when we come out of this our economy is going to going to grow at a, at a pace and and uh and the first people that the first thing that people were will uh will take and spend more money on is better quality food uh which is uh, which is which is positive news for for organics and agriculture in in uh, for agriculture in general. So uh, we'd like to we'd like to take and say that we were we have some new crop pricing. We're still working on it. Uh, when we do uh, when we do end up with uh, when we do end up with some new crop pricing, uh, it will be complete with an act of God. Uh, so, as I say, less in risk to our growers. Uh, a lot of mention has been made to payment terms. Uh, at Seaboard, we, uh, we pride ourselves on taking grain when it, we say it's contracted, and when we, uh, and we pay for it, uh, we're, we talk net 10 business days on, uh, on all contracts after delivery. Uh, with that, we also do offer uh, and are encouraging it this year just to kind of, just to kind of limit limit uh limit contact uh as most of our our staff in regina is working from home today we do have an electronic funds transfer that uh, will get you paid uh well within the the 10 business days on a contract done with us uh again just excited about the opportunity uh we are uh, we are in it for the long term uh and just uh, still hoping to hear some news on a, a bit of a plant uh plant expansion here in Avonlea, which will take and, and hopefully open us up to some more, uh, some more opportunities uh, with, uh, with some cereals and oil seeds as well. So once again, thank you everybody for your time. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them for you right now. Okay, that's, that's great. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, William. And just, just quickly, we've, uh, 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 Alex Heilman has um, has confirmed that it was a unit of measure issue. Um, so the real average price per bushel is 552. So we can all feel a little bit better now about <laughs> about uh, that, that price. So just wanted to to say uh, we ended uh, the call at, or the webinar um, and just checking questions. Uh, uh, William, do you have a price for organic yellow peas? Are you buying? Right now we are... And do you contract we, uh, French green? We do contract French greens. Uh, indicating price on French greens, depending on quality, between that 60 and 70 cents a pound. Uh, again, we just haven't seen the, seen the market pick up the way that we have on conventional. Uh, on yellow peas, uh, working on getting a, getting something we're indicating between that uh, between ten and twelve dollars a bushel. Just haven't got any. Uh, uh, we're still working on getting that that firmed up for uh, for future business here. All right. Um, 
it looks like that's, that's oh and another question where are your markets where are our markets we're at right now we're trying to concentrate on north america just because it's it's a little bit safer uh a little bit safer market when you're not having to not having it on on ship right now uh but we have uh we have been uh trying to do some in europe again it's a little bit tougher a little bit tougher and a little bit more a little bit more with the with the residue uh residue testing that's uh quite costly so we are trying to stay kind of in north america okay thank you um yeah i okay i think i think that's it because i think um we are getting uh close or we've actually just probably gone over um our time a little bit we have so thank you um everybody for uh hanging in and thank you uh to all of our presenters uh we really appreciate you taking the time uh to share what with with our with our members um just a couple of uh closing uh remarks uh, just to remind attendees that you will be receiving um a link to a recording webinar so you can um, listen to it again if if you so choose um, and we are going to be sending you out a survey so if you could uh, fill that out for us that really helps us um, figure out uh, what we can do better um, what we did well and also um, we're going to be asking you if you have some ideas for future topics for webinars um, clearly if this one is an indication it's definitely something that is um, of interest to our members uh, and just before uh, I close uh, the webinar, I just wanted to say to everybody here that SAS Organics um, has been invited to participate um, in a weekly roundtable uh, conference call with um, the Honorable uh, David Merritt, the Minister of Ag for Saskatchewan. So um, if you have any concerns um, or your or any experiences, any of your experiences relating to COVID-19 and impacting your company or your farm, if you can email me, um, it's a great opportunity um, to present these, uh, you know, these concerns directly uh, to the minister. So I should probably thank the sponsors again. Thank you so much. And then finally, I should have had this screen up. This is my contact information. Um, so if you do have uh, any questions about this webinar uh, or uh, about Sask Organics or some concerns you'd like us to raise with the minister, uh, please uh, send me an email. And I think that's it from us here at Sask Organics. Um, thank you again and, and have a great rest of your day.